All right. So yesterday we left off talking about um, the cell theory, okay, and and how basically all things are made of cells, and that cells carry out the basic functions of the organism, okay, and that they all come from the division of existing cells, okay. Those are kind of the big things we need to remember about the cell theory. Today we're going to quickly go over microscopy. Okay, that is uh, kind of some of the things to do with the microscope, how it works, okay, a size calculation, and actually not a calculation, it's an estimation, okay, uh, and then we're going to move on to um, animal versus plant cells, look at modes of nutrition and label our cell diagrams. So we're going to move really, really fast today, okay, so that tomorrow you can go over what all the parts of the cell do, and Friday uh, you can do kind of the pre-lab stuff uh, for the microscopy lab, okay. Uh, so our microscopes look like this, okay. They come in these ghetto-looking dust covers because the dust covers they came with are all destroyed now. So they have giant Ziploc bags over them instead, which still do the job. Um, little things about the uh, microscopes. First off, they are expensive. Okay, If you drop one of these, it will be close to $700 to replace it. All right, because there just aren't a lot of user serviceable parts inside. All right, we have to be very, very careful, okay, when we are handling these. You'll notice that right now I am holding it with how many hands? Yeah, and as should you, okay? Anytime you are holding, carrying, okay, or some other way, moving the microscope that doesn't involve it being on a tabletop, it needs to be done with two hands, one on the base and one on the arm. This, by the way, is called the arm, okay? It's not a neck, it's an arm. You would never put your hand around someone's neck like this. Okay, it's an arm. All right, uh, so uh, we carry it like this. Okay, the reason for that, okay, is that if somebody comes along and you're only carrying it with one hand and they bump you on the funny bone, what does your hand do? Opens. Yeah, crash. All right, not only will the microscope break, but usually it lands on your foot. Okay, which can hurt your foot because they're kind of heavy. All right, so make sure you're always carrying it with two hands. So if anything happens, okay, you've got that kind of uh, leeway there. All right, another thing to be mindful of are the cords. Okay, you, I mean, you make a $700 microscope and you put a 30 cent cord on it. Okay, these cords are incredibly small. Most of them have got aftermarket adapters that we've had to solder on. Okay, and the reason we've had to solder them on is because people don't wrap the cords back up when they're done. And so, what happens is people are carrying the microscope around in the lab with the cord hanging down like this. And then what do they do? They step on the cord while walking and they rip the cord right out of the microscope. Also, usually it pulls the microscope okay, uh, down and onto the floor at the same time. Okay, so uh, little things like that. Okay, make sure the cord is all wrapped up around the microscope when you're carrying it or have it in your hand, okay, while it's on the base, something like that, so that we always make sure that's not dangling anywhere. You can see this one here has got the MacGyver uh, tape job here holding it together. All right. Um, other little things about the microscope, okay, these are nicer than the ones we left you guys at John Paul II when we moved, moved up here, okay? Uh, you don't have to actually move the slide around with your fingers. There's little things on the uh, stage here, on the bottom of the stage, that move the stage around, all right? And you just put the slide in this clip, okay? And it holds it in place, and then you can move it around, which is way more accurate, okay, than, uh, than trying to move the slide with your finger, because you don't also push down on the stage at the same time and lose focus. All right, so uh, those will be used in order to find the specimen, okay, and move it around. There are three objective lenses on the microscope, okay? The smallest one with the red band around it is what we call the scanning power lens. The scanning power lens is for exactly what it would sound like, scanning the slide and looking for your specimen. You're not going to see a lot of detail on the scanning power lens because it's not really for that, okay? Uh, it'll magnify, okay, 40 times. Right, so not much more than Hooke's microscope, but it's enough for you to find things and get them centered. Okay? You do have to get things centered in the field of view before you increase magnification. Okay? The reason for that is how the microscope works. When you look through the scanning power lens, okay, the circle you see is 4 millimeters. That's 4,000 micrometers across. Okay? because there's not a lot of magnification, so you see a greater area, okay? Uh, an analogy to that would be if I'm standing in, uh, like, let's say, uh, Commonwealth Stadium, and I'm looking across to the other side, or I'm in McMahon Stadium, looking across to the other side, okay? And I can see pretty much the whole thing, okay? You guys follow me there? Whereas if I put a pair of binoculars up to my eyes, okay, now the area I see 
is quite a bit what? It's quite a bit smaller. I see a lot more detail. I can probably see people's faces, okay, which I couldn't see before, but I can't see as many of the people. All right? So that's kind of what happens as you get to greater and greater magnification. You see greater and greater detail of a smaller and smaller area. All right? So when, what you have to do is make sure that you get whatever it is you're looking at into the center okay, of your field of view so that when you move up and you are seeing a smaller area, what you are looking at is still in the field of view. If what you're looking at is up here and you move to this magnification, you probably won't see it. Agreed? Okay, Because now it's outside of the field of view. All right, everybody okay with that? Yes? Now, uh, something that will help you with that inside of your uh, microscope, okay, <laughs> this uh, always gives me a laugh because inevitably people ask, okay, when you look through your microscope, you will also see a, uh, a black thing, okay, that looks kind of like this, all right, so it would be like opaque and black, all right, and it points right towards the middle. It's supposed to be there. It's a little wire, actually, that's inside of the, uh, of the body tube here. Okay? Uh, and it's designed to tell you where the center of your field of view is. So you want to try and get your specimen on the end of that pointer before you move up to the next magnification. Okay? Inevitably, I get people that bring their microscopes back. Mr. Coder, there's something wrong with this one. What's wrong with this, this big black thing in there? <laughs> you laugh. I have it happen, okay? Mr. Critter, there's this big black thing in there. Mr. Critter, this one's broken too. That bring me like two, okay? You mean the pointer? Oh, right. Yeah, okay, so that black thing's supposed to be there. All right, so you want to try and get whatever it is you're viewing on the end of that pointer, and that'll ensure that as you increase magnification, it stays in the middle, okay? And you don't lose it. All right. Okay, a couple other little things, okay? Like we said, always carried with one hand on the arm, one hand supporting the base. Microscopes are always returned with that scanning power lens in place. The reason for that is, that's the one you start with. It would be nice if the next person had it in place for them already. But the other reason is because the other ones are a lot longer. And if someone assumes that they're on the scanning power lens and starts cranking away on the coarse focus knob, that's this big one here, they can actually drive the the uh, stage up into the lens and smash the slide they're looking at. And usually when that happens, you also scratch the lens. Now, that may not seem like all that big a deal, but if you get a tiny little microscopic scratch on a lens, what does it do? It magnifies the scratch as many times as the lens magnifies, and a tiny little scratch you can't see with the naked eye becomes this giant slash across your field of view that makes the microscope useless. All right, uh, So you always want to make sure that when you return the microscope, that small scanning power lens is in place. Okay, The other lenses, okay, you've got one with a yellow band on it. That is your low power objective lens. Okay, magnifies 100 times, so you can see a fair amount of detail, but also still a fair amount of space. Okay, so you might be able to see multiple specimens with that one. All right, and then you've got your high power lens. That's the one with the light blue band on it. Okay, magnifies 400 times. This one is all for looking at little tiny details. Okay, you are unlikely to see more than one specimen, at least for the things we're looking at, okay, under that magnification, but you can see a great deal of detail about it. Okay, everybody with me there? All right. Now, if you find that there's a smudge, you're looking through your microscope, there's a bit of a smudge on there, and it doesn't seem to go away when you change lenses, there's probably a big fingerprint or something on one of the lenses. That happens. Okay? Please do not do this. Okay? Or this. Okay? Because you wouldn't believe how much microscopic grit is on both your fingers and your clothes at all times. All right? Um, that microscopic grit will cause scratches on the lenses and make the microscope useless. So there is special lens cleaning paper in the lab that we use. So if you need to clean one of your lenses, come up to the front and ask for a piece of lens paper, and I will give it to you. Okay? Those can be used once. Okay? Use them once. Use a different spot. If you're cleaning more than one lens, use a different spot on the paper right? so that whatever it picks up doesn't get smeared onto the next lens. Okay? So it's very important that we use that special paper for cleaning the lenses. All right, um, yeah, so that's the basic kind of handling and use of the microscope. Questions on that? OK, 
Okay, when you're in the lab and the microscope is on the table, okay, there's also a little on-off switch here that turns on the light, light source, okay, here. Um, and you can adjust the brightness of that. There's a, uh, a Rio stat right here, okay, that will adjust the brightness of that. You can also adjust how much light comes through, okay, with uh, the condenser diaphragm. That's this thing right here. It's got a little tab on it, okay, that opens and closes a little iris. Okay, that's uh, inside this piece here, okay, and that can actually help you to make things stand out. It improves the contrast, okay, of the image you're, you're looking at, makes the edges of things sharper. Um, yeah, I think that's generally it. The other thing, guys, is you shouldn't need to move the microscope along the table like this, okay, very often. Okay, if you've got more than one person in your group, the top rotates. All right, because the more you move this thing around, like as soon as it moves like this, it's probably gone out of focus. Okay, the more you slide it and bump it, the more the stage will move, and especially on high power, the, your whatever you're looking at will be out of focus. So it's better to just, hey, I got it in focus, check it out. Okay, and and move this thing over. To do our uh, to do our diagrams, we'll just stick our phones on the lens here with the camera and snap pictures. Okay, through our phones for those. We'll show you. We'll talk more about those on Monday. All right, um, so your lens is here. Like we said, um, we measure everything on a, uh, in, on a microscope in micrometers. Okay, a micrometer is, 1, 000, 1, is 10 to the minus 6 meters. Okay, a millimeter is 10 to the minus 3 meters. So there's how many millimeters in a meter? A thousand. Okay, there are a thousand micrometers in a millimeter. Right? So micrometers are very, very small, but so are the things we're looking at. Right? So we use micrometers to measure the stuff we look at through the microscope. All right? So our scanning power lens is 4,000 micrometers across. So let's say I'm looking at something through my scanning power lens, and it appears to be that big. How big is it? I'd say, yeah, it's about 1,000 micrometers, because it takes up about a quarter of the field of view. Okay, that is how you estimate the size of objects through the microscope. Okay, you simply know how far across the microscope is, and you estimate from that how big it is. Okay, here when you're looking through your high power lens, the distance across is 400 micrometers. Right, so much much smaller. So if something takes up half of that field of view, how big is it? 200 micrometers. Is that pretty easy? Right, it's not an exact mathematical calculation; it's an estimation. Right, so all you have to do is Estimate how big it is based on the field of view of your lenses. Please write down these numbers in your notes. Okay, you're going to need these. Every time we look through the microscope, you're going to have to estimate the size of the objects. Okay, and for our microscopes, the scanning power lens has a magnification of 40x, a field of view of 4,000 micrometers. The low power has a f uh, magnification of 1,000 times, or sorry, of 100 times, and it is... Okay, 1,600 micrometers across. And then for the high power, its magnification is 400, and its field of view is 400 micrometers. Okay, and that is true for all of our microscopes, because all of our microscopes are the same. All right, so we're going to move on here now, guys, to plant versus animal cells. That's lesson four. We're skipping a little bit here, okay, um, just because it, I'm not going to be here for the next two classes, so I kind of have to cover a couple of different things here. All right, uh, so what we're going to look at in this lesson here is uh, understand how plant and animal cells are different, okay, understand why those differences are present, why they're necessary differences, okay, because we talked the other day or yesterday about how similar they are. Uh, and then we're going to be able to correctly label plant and animal cells. So you can bet that probably here for a while your quizzes will be cell diagrams. Okay, then you'll have to label them, give me the function of the structures, okay, and things like that starting next week. Okay, there's different modes of nutrition, okay, in biology. Modes of nutrition means how do you get your energy? Okay. Now, the source of energy for all cells is glucose. Right? Whatever food we eat, 
Okay? If we want to use it for energy, it has to be converted into glucose. Right? That is the job of your digestive system okay? and uh, certain cells in your body and things like that. All right? Some things that we eat are very easily turned into glucose. For example, carbohydrates. All right? If you eat breads, cereals, rice, okay, and things like that, okay, that are full of starches, starches are very easily turned into sugars because really all a starch is is a bunch of sugars stuck together. All right? So when you, um, when you eat that, your body breaks it down into glucose and your cells can use glucose Okay, uh, as energy. Right? Um, if we eat fats, okay, fats are also reasonably easily turned into glucose, not as easily as carbohydrates, but still reasonably easily. Um, and proteins is usually the other group of food that we eat. Okay? Proteins are the hardest to turn into glucose, right? which is why oftentimes if you're on some sort of weight loss plan, they often encourage you to eat stuff that's mostly water, okay? so like vegetables and things like that that don't have a lot of carbs in them, and a lot of protein. Because okay? your body has to work harder to get glucose from pr protein than it does from carbohydrates okay? or fats. Everyone follow me there? In, I in any case, the fuel for all cells, plants, animals, whatever, is glucose. Right? If you're an animal, you get your glucose from eating other organisms, be it plant or animal. If you're a plant, how do you get your glucose? From the sun. Well, not to, I mean you use the sun's energy to make it using what process? Photosynthesis. Okay? Photosynthesis is the process by which carbon dioxide, water, okay, and sunlight okay, are used to make glucose. All right? And then obviously we can eat plant-based products because they would contain carbohydrates and starches. All right. Um, so looking here, this diagram shows uh, photosynthesis here, okay, where we've got you know, oxygen being released by photosynthesis, carbon dioxide taken in. Okay? The plant makes that glucose, and then its cells do the same thing that our cells do with it, burn it. Okay? That process is identical between plants and animals. It's just how we get the glucose that's different. How we get glucose is our mode of nutrition. Okay? Everyone with me there? All right. So if you're an animal, like we said, you eat something else. Okay? You break down that material. Okay? If you're a plant, you make it. Okay. Chemoheterotrophs is what we call organisms that have to consume other organisms in order to get their fuel. Okay? Chemo meaning chemical, hetero meaning others, trough meaning feeder. Okay? So they get chemicals from other organisms through feeding. Okay? That's what chemoheterotroph means. All right? So examples of chemoheterotrophs, earthworms, okay? obviously sharks, animals, okay? and fungus. Okay? Fungus is actually more similar to animals than it is to plants. Right, in the way that it gets its energy. Right? If you have, uh, let's say, athlete's foot. Okay? Athlete's foot is a fungus. It's really itchy. Why is it itchy? Because the fungus is eating your feet. Okay? That's how a fungus works. It actually secretes digestive enzymes, similar to what's in your stomach, okay? and that digests your cells, okay? the cells that surround the fungus. Okay? And that's what makes it itchy. It's actually destroying your cells and then absorbing the nutrients from your cells. All right? So that's what happens with athlete's foot. Okay? It's a fungus that eats your feet. Yeah. Okay? If it gets out of control, okay, if you're a very immune depressed, it, you can actually start to get like lesions and sores okay, on your feet if a fungus gets out of control. Pretty gross, all right? But okay, that's essentially how fungus works, and that's oftentimes why you see them living on dead, decaying materials, right? They just kind of start growing on, like, let's say, a fallen log. Okay, they're digesting that stuff. They're growing. They're putting in. They look like roots, but they're not really roots. Okay, um, they put them in through the material, and they secrete enzymes out. They digest the food outside their body, and then they absorb the nutrients back in. All right, so their digestion is opposite of ours in terms of externally. Okay, but it, the chemically, it's very similar. Okay, all chemoheterotrophs have to contain this cellular structure, a lysosome. Right? A lysosome is a little organelle that contains digestive enzymes that help to break down small particles of food. Obviously, the particles of food must be microscopic to be within the cell. Right? Okay, uh, this term might also be new to you, organelles, OK? 
Okay, organelles are the structures that are inside of a cell. Okay, so the nucleus is an organelle. All right, the lysosome is an organelle. The mitochondria are an organelle. Okay, they're the cells, organs, organelles. Okay, that's kind of where we get that from. All right, uh, so the lysosomes contain the digestive enzymes that break down food molecules, and they generally are turning it into glucose so that the mitochondria can burn the glucose, okay, and that releases the energy within. All right, everybody with me there? Okay, knowing this word okay, is going to be important. Chemoheterotrophs, that's an important term okay, for this unit. All right, so inside of an animal cell, okay, some of the differences for an animal cell. First off, an animal cell does not have a cell wall, okay? A cell wall is rigid and often hard, right? Would it be advantageous for us to have hard, rigid cell walls around all of our cells? No, okay, because then you wouldn't be flexible, right? It, it would be difficult to move because your cells would not change shape very easily, right? Our cells don't have a cell wall. They just have a very flexible cell membrane and a bunch of fibers, okay, that kind of connect different parts of the cell so that the cell doesn't stretch too far and rupture, okay? Uh, so these, these cells can then easily change shape and allow us freedom of movement, which is important since we have to be able to capture our food to do that, you got to be able to move. All right. Okay. So, um, animal cells contain fibrous materials. Okay, that allow the cell to change shape. Okay, and only have a flexible outer membrane. Now, how important is it for a plant to be flexible? Not very. Yeah. Okay, a plant's main concern is how is it going to acquire light and water? All right, if it's going to acquire light, it probably needs to be what? Especially if it's growing in a forest. Tall. Okay, and to be tall, you probably also need to be pretty rigid. If you're tall and flexible, yeah, you're probably going to get bent over in the first strong wind. Okay, which is why they are very rigid. Okay, even plants that don't grow necessarily very tall, okay, still are relatively stiff. Okay, so if we're looking at this plant here, okay, even these stalks here, I mean, they're somewhat flexible, right, but they're reasonably stiff. You look at the plants over by the window here, okay, they've got, okay, very stiff, okay, kind of stems or trunks, depending on the type of plant, like this one here, you can't bend at all, okay, uh, the Norfolks, they've, they're covered in spines, so I'm not going to do that, okay, um, these ones here, these kind of big palms, okay, you can see that the trunks are quite rigid, okay, they have to be, right, they don't have a skeleton, so they have to maintain their, their shape with these rigid walls, okay, making sense so far? Right, so we, like we say, within this, within the animal cell, okay, these are. I'm going to circle the structures that are going to only be kind of in the animal cell. Okay, peroxisome is like a lysosome; it's only in there. Okay, lysosome, obviously. All right, um, and then this cytoskeleton here. Okay, that's an important one. That's kind of what keeps the cell from rupturing as it changes shape. So the fibers are somewhat flexible. Okay. And one that's not on this diagram is centrioles, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. Okay, if you can make your own energy using photosynthesis, you are what we call a photoautotroph. Okay, photo means light, auto means self, trough means feeding. So you feed yourself with light. Okay, it's essentially what the, what we're seeing with photoautotroph. Okay, so they can produce their own food by capturing sunlight, using its power to remove carbon from carbon dioxide. Okay, to produce sugar for energy by photosynthesis. Okay, so really, what photosynthesis looks like is this. Seen a chemical reaction that looked something like that before? What does it sort of look like? 
It kind of looks like combustion, except it's backwards. Okay? Well, that's because this is how you get fuel for combustion. Okay? This process takes the waste products of combustion and turns them back into combustible materials. Okay? The only thing they need is some input energy to make it happen. All right? So the process that goes on in our body, okay, and in within the, the cells of a plant, when we start using this stuff here is glucose, by the way, okay? When we start using the glucose, the reaction goes the opposite direction. Okay? So when we use glucose, so that's C6H12O6, okay, uh, sorry, plus oxygen gives us CO2 and water. That's why we exhale carbon dioxide. Okay? So this is photosynthesis, and this is cell respiration. You'll learn more about that in Bio 20, okay? But these are the processes that release and provide energy for cells. All right? And they're a cycle, okay? Which is kind of what we see here in this diagram, okay? We call it the carbon cycle. Right? So plants okay, can, take, can take the carbon dioxide and they can turn it into sugar. Okay? We use the oxygen okay, and we release carbon dioxide and water and the plants can take that with this green arrow here and turn it back into organic compounds and, well, we just keep feeding each other. Right? Have you ever heard that if you talk to a plant, it grows better? Yeah, because what are you doing to it? You're giving it carbon dioxide. Okay, so if you're standing next to a plant and talking to it, if it talks back, you have to start worrying. Okay, but if you talk to it, okay, you, uh, you actually exhale carbon dioxide onto it. They, they actually did a study where they, they uh, wanted to test whether what you said to the plant made a difference. You know what they found? If you talked really mean to a plant, it grew better. Because usually when you're talking mean, you're also yelling. You exhaled harder and exhaled more carbon dioxide onto the plant. So you, if you talk mean to your plant, it actually grows better. Don't don't go home and practice that though, because yeah, okay, you might start talking mean to people, or your plant will start talking back to you. Okay, all right. So organisms that can organisms that uh, can carry out photosynthesis are photoautotrophs. Okay. Questions on that mode of nutrition. Okay, so the two modes of nutrition we need to know. Chemoheterotrophs are organisms that consume other organisms for their food energy. Photoautotrophs can make their own food energy using carbon dioxide, water, and light. Okay, in order to be a photoautotroph, you must have a specialized organelle within your cell. That specialized organelle is the chloroplast. Okay, chloroplasts, like their name would imply, contain chlorophyll. And chlorophyll is that photosynthetic pigment that allows plants to carry out photosynthesis. Okay, do all plant cells contain chloroplasts? Nope, they don't. Not all of them. What cells in a plant would not need chloroplasts? Uh, no, actually, the stem will usually have chloroplasts in it. The roots, yeah, it's kind of dark underground. It can't carry a lot of photosynthesis under there. Okay, so you might actually find one or two root cells that actually have chloroplasts in them, but they're not doing anything. Okay, because they're not receiving any light, so it's a waste of energy to make them. All right, so within a plant cell, okay, some of the differences that we can see first off is this rigid cell wall. Okay? It still has a cell membrane. All cells have a cell membrane, but it's surrounded by this wall. Okay? The wall is made of cellulose, okay? if it's a plant cell wall. It's, it's made of something called cellulose, which is commonly referred to as us as fiber. Okay? How many people have heard, I've got to get more fiber. Right? Get more, get more fiber in your diet helps you poop better. Okay? Yeah. You get more fiber in your diet. Well, the reason you're supposed to get more fiber in your diet is because you can't digest it. Okay? We don't have any enzymes capable of digesting cell walls of plants. Okay? So essentially, any fiber that you eat goes through you unaltered and acts like a brush. Yeah, 
Okay, kind of helps keep your intestines clear. All right, uh, and that's good for you actually, believe it or not. Okay, keeps uh, you know, polyps and stuff like that from forming and things like that. So, um, the stuff that these cells are made of, we as carnivores are unable to digest. Are there animals that can? Yeah, I mean, if all you eat is grass you probably had better be able to digest this stuff, okay? So um, anything that's a herbivore, like cows and moose and, you know, and deer and things like that, they have a different stomach than we do, right? Their stomach has four chambers in it, and uh, they actually have the ability to digest and break down cellulose and turn it into sugar where we do not, all right? Um, yeah, and so if you've ever watched a cow eat, right, they eat the grass, they chew it, and then if you watch them carefully, they kind of puke it back up and chew it again, okay? They do. It's called chewing their cud. They, they chew it again and swallow it, and that helps to ruminate it, okay, and kind of have it ferment. If you've ever seen the inside of a cow's stomach, it smells like silage, okay, just basically rotting grass, because that's exactly what's going on in there, is grass is rotting, okay, and releasing some energy. All right, um, so plants have to be able to support these long stems. The cell wall is part of that support, okay? More important even than the cell wall is this structure that we did not see in the animal cell. Plant cells have inside of them a water vacuole, okay, which is basically just a big balloon, okay, full of water within the cell. Okay, if you put water in a sealed container, okay, it can exert pressure. All right, I mean you've all made a water balloon before, right? Okay, and if you fill it really, really full, it actually gets fairly rigid. All right, and that's kind of what you want. That way, when it hits someone, it bursts. All right, if you don't fill it very full, it's actually quite flexible, and they usually don't pop when they hit someone. All right, well, the water vacuole is like a really full water balloon. It exerts a fair amount of pressure. It's fairly rigid, and because of that, it pushes everything inside the cell against the cell wall, adding an extra amount of support to the cell. Okay, now, how many of you have seen what a, a plant looks like if you don't water it for a while? Okay, and I'm not talking like it's already crunchy, okay? It's just kind of getting wilted, okay? And unfortunately, I watered my plants a few weeks ago, okay? Um, so they're not wilty. They often get wilty looking because I forget about them, right? Um, but the leaves kind of get limp, okay? And they almost look kind of wrinkly a little bit, and they're kind of soft, right? That's what happens when the plant gets dehydrated. It begins to draw water out of the water vacuole to survive, it doesn't like to have to do that, but in an emergency, it will. And when it takes water out of here, the cells don't have as much support, so they get soft, okay? And the plant wilts. If you give it more water, it'll come right back, right? If you let it get crunchy, then it's too late, okay? Everyone follow there, okay? So they have to have these structures because plants, an important resource for them is light. And to get light, you usually have to be tall. Oh, not long. Yeah, not long at all. The, the roots can begin absorbing stuff within minutes. Yeah. Okay. Everybody with me there? Right. So there's some differences. Obviously, you, you have to have an organ, an organelle that carries out photosynthesis if you're a photoautotroph, but you also have to have these other structures that help support the overall plant. Okay. Now, is, are, is the combination of cell walls and water vacuoles going to support a giant tree? Okay, to support a giant multicellular plant organism like a tree, okay, uh, plants also secrete okay, a protein called lignin. Okay, and lignin acts like cement, right? and it cements the cell walls together. Right? In the same way that if you just make a wall out of bricks, but you don't cement them together, you can push the bricks over. Right? But if you put mortar, cement in between them, and it hardens, then you can't because now they're all attached. That's what lignin does. Lignin is what makes a plant um, have like wood. Okay, it's what makes the woody part of a plant. All right, because uh, if you look at some of these, like um, some of these plants are fleshy, and some of them are more stiff. Okay, and so the amount of of, of that hardened lignin material, okay, makes, determines whether a plant is tree-like and has a big trunk, okay, or whether it is spongier. All right, everyone follow me there? So there's different structures, different processes that have to go on depending on your mode of nutrition. All right, now, if we compare plant and animal cells, obviously 
first look, yeah, they're different. But closer look, there's a lot in common. And that's what we were talking about yesterday. Okay, they both have a nucleus. Why is the nucleus important? That's where the DNA is. Okay, all cells have to have DNA in them, at least a little bit, because they have to be able to carry out certain processes. And those processes are coded for in your DNA. Okay, uh, they also have this uh, pink stuff here with the dots on it. That's called rough endoplasmic reticulum. You'll just know it is rough ER. Okay, you won't have to remember the endoplasmic reticulum part. Okay, but they both have that around the nucleus, and its job is kind of to transport proteins and, and make uh, hormones and things like that. Okay, uh, and then there's this stuff that looks kind of like it, except it doesn't have the bumps on it, and it's called smooth endoplasmic reticulum. They both have that. Okay, um, you can see that they both have this structure right here. Okay, that's the Golgi apparatus, kind of the garbage man of the cell, helps get rid of wastes. Okay, um, they both have these things. These are mitochondria, okay, and they burn sugar to release its energy. Right. Uh, so they both do that process, okay. It's how they get the sugar that determines their mode of nutrition. Once they have the sugar, the processes after that are identical. Um, and then they're both filled with the same material, okay. A cell is not full of air. A cell is full of fluid, okay, and that fluid is called cytoplasm. Okay, and it's identical between a plant and an animal cell as well. All right. Okay, questions there? Okay, they also both have a cell membrane. Okay, um, just in a plant cell, the membrane is inside of the wall. So the job of the cell wall, and this is something that people often get confused with. Okay, they see the cell wall, they see it as this thing that covers up the entire cell, and they, they assume, because of how it looks, that it protects the cell. Okay, the cell wall does nothing of the kind. Right? The cell wall is, serves no protective function whatsoever. The cell wall is like a house that's been framed, but that's it. Okay, so if you've ever watched a house being built, one of the first stages is they put up the frame of the house. Okay, you guys know what I mean by the frame? Right, the studs are there, and that's basically the walls, but you can walk through them. That's what the cell wall is like. The cell wall is like a house that's been framed, but not sheeted. Okay, so you could walk right in in and out through the walls, right? The cell wall is like that. It's, it's an interlaced kind of thing of fibers. So basically anything can get in and out of it. What protects the cell is the cell membrane, okay? That's inside of the cell wall for a plant or the outer covering of an animal cell, right? That is like the border patrol, okay, that controls what gets in and out of the cell. That's what protects the cell, okay? Is it 100% efficient? Nope. Sometimes stuff gets by, right? But for the most part, it does a good job of it. Okay. All right. Okay. I want you guys to quickly answer these questions, and I'm going to hand out your cell diagrams, and then we'll label those. All right. So, going over the answers for these here, guys. What's the main reason for the differences between plant and animal cells? So this answer can be three words long. Modes of nutrition. Okay, obviously if I asked that question on a test, it would need to be longer than three words. Okay, you'd probably have to explain what modes of nutrition was, but since we've just covered that, okay, modes of nutrition is how do they get their glucose? Okay, are they photosynthetic? Do they have to eat something else? Okay, how is it that they go about that? All right, for number two, what organelle supplies plants with energy and what process does it use? What's the green thing? Chloroplast, right. And what process does the chloroplast use to make glucose? Photosynthesis. Okay, and what organelle supplies animal cells with energy? Starts with an L. The lysosome, right? Okay, and it does that by digesting food. Okay, so it breaks down 
kind of complex stuff into simpler molecules like glucose, breaks down proteins into amino acids, fats into fatty acids, okay, and things like that. All right, for number four, transport within plant and animal cells is done in the same fashion, okay? So how they move things from place to place is the same, okay? Why would that be? Why would, why, why would they not have come up with something different, okay, um, when so many other things have changed? It's the most efficient way, okay? Guys, that's kind of the way natural selection okay, and evolution works. Okay? Natural selection selects those traits that are most advantageous for a certain environment. Okay? So if you're an owl, okay, you want to have eyes that help you see in the dark. Okay? Having eyes that only work in the day as an owl is not going to be advantageous to you because that's not when you hunt. All right? um, if you are a wolf and all of your teeth are flat, you're probably not going to do very well because you need to be able to rip and tear at meat when you kill something. Okay? Um, so obviously those are things that would be selected against. Okay? If you were a wolf that had really strong muscles that allowed you to run really fast and incredibly sharp teeth, that would be an advantage. You would survive and pass those traits on to your young, okay? who would pass those traits on to their young and so on and so on. That's how natural selection and evolution kind of work. Okay? Since the way that cells transport materials works, okay, it would be kept by all cell types because nothing better has evolved. Okay? And how do new things come along? Well, mutations happen. Okay? Changes to DNA occur, and that results in a slight change in an organism. If that change is advantageous, they might pass that thing on to their offspring because it's a genetic change. All right? A mutation is not what you've seen in the X-Men. Okay? You don't suddenly grow like giant blades out of your hands okay? or the ability to breathe underwater. All right? It's usually something small, all right? and that might be passed on. Okay, does so everyone kind of follow me there? All right, so a mutation is a small genetic change that occurs, okay, not after you're born either. Okay, the genetic change occurs, okay, kind of during your development. All right, um, so yeah, if that's an advantage, then it would be genetically passed on to your offspring. Okay, if it's a disadvantage, you, this sounds cruel, but nature is cruel, you probably die before you pass that on. Okay, if it's something that doesn't work well, okay, or is a disadvantage, like let's say you're a wolf with flat teeth, you're probably going to starve, okay, because you won't be able to get uh, very good, uh, very good nutrition, or you're just getting enough to get by and you're weak and you don't have enough energy to reproduce, or you can't get mates because, well, you're undesirable or something. That I know that sounds really awful from like a sociological perspective, but from a biological perspective, that's how it works. Okay, um, like if you're a peacock and you got like big feathers and you're very brightly colored and whatever else, like the female peacocks really like that. Okay, and so you reproduce more often. Whereas if you're a dull-colored peacock, nobody wants anything to do with you. Right? And yeah, so it's it's like that. That's how kind of natural selection and evolution kind of work. Okay. All right. Uh, for number five. The nutritional needs of plants and animals are very different. If you're an animal, there's got to be other living things out there for you to eat. Okay? If you're a plant, all you need is carbon dioxide, water, and sunlight. So which do you suppose would have done better on Earth billions of years ago? That's what we call primordial Earth. When Earth was first developing, okay, was there a lot of life around or was there very little life? Well, we do know, actually. The fossil record tells us there was very little. Okay? Very little life. It also, the fossil record and geological evidence also tells us that the Earth's atmosphere had a lot more carbon dioxide in it at that time. Okay? A lot less free oxygen and a lot of other kind of noxious chemicals. So, okay, most likely, the first organisms on Earth would have been photosynthetic because the resources for that mode of nutrition would have been available as they kind of, you know, grew and there were more and more of them, mutations may have come along that resulted in organisms being able to do both photosynthesis as well as uh, consuming other organisms. And then, you know, evolution would have caused that, that kind of divergence, okay? And we w we'll talk about that later on in the unit, okay? But probably plants would have done best because those resources would have been more readily available, all right? And you didn't have to move around to get them. Right? You could kind of just stay in one place and the sun hit you. 
right? There wasn't a lot to block the sun back then either. Okay. All right, questions on any of those? Okay. Well, let's look at these cell diagrams then. All right, so we'll start with the animal cell. Okay, and you're going to want to put these labels on as we go. All right, first thing we're going to look at are these two yellow things here in the middle. Okay, these are present only in animal cells. All right, they are called centrioles. Okay. Animal cells need centrioles because when a cell divides, the first thing it does is it copies all of its DNA because each of the new cells needs to have a copy of the DNA. So it, it copies all of its DNA. What the centrioles do then is they migrate to opposite ends of the cell and they put out these fibers that are kind of like cables or ropes and they attach to the chromosomes that have been copied. Chromosomes contain DNA. Okay? And before the cell divides, they retract these cables. Right? And that pulls the DNA that the, each cell will need to the separate sides. Okay? They ensure that each cell gets the DNA that it requires. All right? So uh, the reason that animals have this and plants don't is because animal cells are flexible. And it's possible that, a, that an animal cell could change shape radically in the process of dividing. And if that were to happen, some of the DNA might not get where it was supposed to go. Right? So they have these things that ensure the DNA is latched and goes to the right place, regardless of what happens to the shape of the cell during the division process. And a plant cell doesn't need that because a plant cell's shape is fixed and rigid. So it's not going to change shape in the middle of division, okay? And as a result, it will survive, okay? And it'll get the DNA where it needs to go. All right. Um, next thing here, okay? You see these kind of long noodle-looking things here, okay? These are uh, microtubules. That's a U, not an A. Sorry, guys, my penmanship is so awful. It still looks like an A. Tubules. There we go. Okay, those are U's now. All right. We also sometimes call them microfilaments. Yeah, a filament like what's in a light bulb, and sometimes we also call them microfibers. It all depends on the diagram, okay? And sometimes they look thinner and whatever. Anyway, they're essentially all doing the same job, and that is that they attach to the inside of the cell membrane and they keep the cell from rupturing during violent cell shape changes, okay? All right, the thing right beside these little noodles here, okay? is just a little bubble that's got some food in it. Well, usually those are lysosomes, okay? Because that food is being digested, right? And again, you're only going to find those in, uh, in an animal cell. Because obviously plant cells do not require them. All right, now going up top here, we see something that looks kind of like this one, except that it's empty, okay? It doesn't have any food in it yet. So it isn't a lysosome right now. Right now, it's what we call a peroxisome, which means it's a bubble that contains digestive enzymes, but not any food yet. Okay? So when a cell consumes food, the food vacuole goes over and merges with these things, and then they become a lysosome because then digestion is going on. Okay? Lysosomes and peroxisomes um, are a little bit dangerous as well. Okay, because what are they supposed to do? Yeah, they're supposed to digest food. And what's the food made out of? You probably ate other organisms, right, that are made of cells. So this stuff has to digest the stuff that cells are made out of. So you probably don't want that stuff getting loose inside the cell, because what will it do? 
it'll eat the cell. Okay? That's why it's contained within these, these membranes and inside of these bubbles. Okay? The bubbles can contain that stuff, but if it gets out, it'll damage the other cell parts. Okay? In fact, that's kind of the cell's self-destruct mechanism. All right? in terms of, uh, of an animal cell anyway. Okay? A lot of times animal cells can detect that they are damaged or are malfunctioning. If they do that, they, c they will undergo what's called cell lysis. They rupture all the lysosomes and peroxisomes within the cell and eat themselves to death. Okay? They just, these things just pop and the cell essentially destroys itself to prevent it from affecting nearby cells. Right? That's the process that's supposed to prevent okay, um, like cancerous tumors and things like that from forming. And in most healthy people, that's exactly what it does. Okay? But as you age, that mechanism begins to break down. Cells have a tougher time figuring out if they're working properly or not. And that's why typically elderly people tend to have cancer more often than younger people do. Okay? Everybody with me there? All right. Okay, you can see these thinner little things here. Okay, these are actually the microfibers, microfilaments. Okay, we, we labeled them down below, but these are, these are actually microfibers. They're smaller. Microtubules are actually like a noodle. They're hollow in the middle. Okay, they're like macaroni. All right. These are more like spaghetti. Okay, not hollow in the middle. These are like macaroni. Okay, we're having a past a lesson now, but okay. Um, they do the same job, they're just a little bit more flexible. All right, this big orange thing, and you can see that there are lots of them, okay? These ones here down below are also the same thing. These ones are just cut in half so you can see what's inside, okay? These are mitochondria, okay? Plant cells have these too. These break down glucose to release its energy. This is where the combustion reaction that is cell respiration happens. Okay, so that's where, where, the, um, where the sugars are broken down. So these have a very thick double membrane because they generate a lot of heat. Okay, in the process of breaking down sugar and releasing its energy, heat is released. Right? Uh, so if you're exercising, these things are running hotter. All right, and that's why you have to sweat and whatever to cool yourself down. These things are having to produce more energy, so they produce more heat. If you have a fever, these things run at a kicked up rate. All right, and as a result, your body temperature goes up. Okay, all those kinds of things. All right, uh, this thing here. For some reason, every diagram of an animal cell I have ever seen has one of these on it. When almost no animal cells actually have one. In fact, if you're a girl, you don't have any cells that have one of these. Okay? It's called a flagellum. It's a whip-like tail that can propel the cell around. If you're a guy, you have some of these in your body because your sperm have them on them. Okay? It's the whip-like tail that propel the sperm around. All right? Um, but yeah, I don't know why they're on every animal cell diagram you ever look at, but almost no animal cells actually have one. All right, but it's on there, so it's called a flagellum. Okay, all right. Now looking at this big purple thing, the outside of the big purple thing is called the nuclear membrane. Okay, that's an E nuclear. nuclear membrane. Okay, the nuclear membrane is a special kind of membrane. It uh, it's a little bit thicker. Uh, stuff doesn't get through it. Okay, because we have to protect what's inside the nucleus, and what's inside the nucleus is DNA. Okay, we don't want that stuff to get damaged or anything like that. All right, so this is the nucleus. Okay, that's where all the DNA is, and the big purple dot inside is the nucleolus. It is those two things where spelling is really important. Okay? I often have people who they can't remember which one's which, so they write nucleolus on there thinking I'll give it to them as a spelling mistake. No, you got to spell those two correctly. Okay? You either know what they are and how they're spelled or not. Okay? Because uh, they are different and they have different jobs, which you'll find out about tomorrow. Okay, These ones here, 
Okay, these two lines are pointing at these little dots. These little dots are called ribosomes. Okay, sometimes they're free within the cell, and other times they're attached to the uh, rough ER. Okay, ribosomes make protein. Okay, that's their single sole purpose. All right, the blue stuff with the ribosomes on it is the rough endoplasmic reticulum, which we will abbreviate ER. Okay, rough ER. Okay, the outside of the cell is the cell membrane, right, for a plant, for an animal cell anyway, it's the cell membrane. Okay, that controls what gets in and out of the cell, or what we call endocytosis and exocytosis. Okay, this stuff here looks like the other ER, except it doesn't have the bumps. And anything that doesn't have bumps is smooth. So, it's smooth ER. Okay, and the smooth ER is probably the most important organelle in the cell other than the nucleus. Okay, it has many, many jobs. All right, and then this big thing here is the Golgi apparatus. Right. And the Golgi apparatus packages waste for removal from the cell. The reason waste usually gets packaged is waste is usually toxic, and you don't want it to be in the, the cytoplasm and touching other things in the cell. Okay, now, in regards to the cytoplasm, it is not labeled. So you need to draw an arrow that points to nothing within the cell, and that stuff is the fluid that fills up the cell called cytoplasm. If there was no cytoplasm, stuff wouldn't be able to diffuse from place to place within the cell. Okay, questions on any of those? Okay, can I move on to the plant cell? Yeah. All right, I'm going to start with the ones that aren't common, just in case we run out of time. Okay, so we're going to start with the ones that the plant cell has that the animal cell doesn't. First off, the big green thing is the chloroplasts. Okay, the chloroplast carries out photosynthesis. Okay, um, the big, big thing here in the middle was the water vacuole. All right, and that helps just push everything against the inside of the cell wall and helps support. Okay, the it has a special membrane around the outside. That's what this line here is pointing at, called a tonoplast. Okay, and then obviously the outer orange, it's orange on here, but in real life it's not orange, it's green. Okay, but the, the outer wall is called the cell wall. Okay, and then you can see in here, they've cut the cell wall away so that you could see the cell membrane. Okay, just so you would know and remember that a plant cell also has a cell membrane in addition to the cell wall. Okay, um, just so you know, I tried to erase these two here. Just erase them. They're not supposed to be there, these two lines here. Okay, um, everything else is the same as in the animal cell, so we'll just kind of quickly go through it. Okay, we got a nuclear membrane. Okay, a uh, nucleus. Okay, and uh, the nucleolus here. And we got rough ER right there. Okay, and if it's a structure that they have in common, it's doing the same thing. Okay, so all the stuff I told you they did, they do in the plant cell as well. Okay, and this is the smooth ER. Okay, um, this one here, it's not supposed to be on the diagram, so scribble it out because they don't have peroxisomes. Okay, the big uh, orange thing there is the Golgi apparatus. Okay, we got ribosomes. Okay, mitochondria. Okay, 
Okay, and again, the cytoplasm is not labeled, so draw a line into the middle, okay, where it's not touching anything else, okay, and that'll be your cytoplasm. Okay, don't lose those diagrams. Okay, expect that Tuesday's quiz will be a cell diagram that you will have to label. And it won't look exactly like this, okay? Um, but it will be a cell diagram. And of course, as always, you'll get it on Monday night so you can figure out what everything is. Okay? All right, questions on any of that stuff? Can we? Oh, these are, not that I'll ever ask you this, but they are called plasmodesmata. Um, they're just so the cytoplasm can go between cells and they can share material. I'm never going to ask you what they are. Pardon me? We're going to go over all that stuff tomorrow. The, the smooth ER has got tons of jobs. The rough ER is mostly transportation of protein, okay, things like that.